It's good to have you all with us, and it's, uh, it's good to be able to share the word of the Lord with you this morning on this very first day of 2017. And I want to read a very familiar story to you from Luke chapter 15, and uh, I'm reading from verse 11. In Luke chapter 15, the, right at the very beginning of the chapter, it starts with the scribes and the Pharisees having a go at Jesus because he was so friendly with the publicans and with sinners. And, uh, and Jesus answers them. He responds to this accusation by giving three stories. The first story was the story of the lost sheep. The second story was the story of the lost coin. And I wish I had time to get into all of those this morning, but I don't. The third one was the story of the lost son. And that's the one I want to bring to your attention this morning. We read this in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Wow. I think that takes us back, or probably all of us a bit, eh? Um, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. The, um, uh, I just love that part. So he got up and he did something. And we read this. Uh, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe out and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. That's this time of the year when we do a lot of celebrating, probably a little bit more than we should, or some of us should anyway. Um, verse 25, meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the, um, one of the servants and, and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Oh, that's always good for a father, isn't it? The older brother became angry. Can you believe it? He became angry. The older brother was offended by what was happening and what was going on around the younger brother. He was offended by his father's forgiveness, by his father's acceptance of him. He was offended by the grace extended to the, to the younger brother. Isn't that incredible? And he says, and he wouldn't, he, he, so he wouldn't, he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered the father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me, <laughs> says even a young goat. I feel like putting my own words into this and saying, even a tough old goat. <laughs> and you haven't given me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, 
You killed a fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead, and he's alive again, and he was lost, and he's found. I want to talk on the subject of offensive grace, grace that brings Offense, And I'd like to run through the story with you very quickly now. I know that to many of you, this story is incredibly familiar. You've read it many times and you've probably heard many sermons preached on it. But I want to ask you a favor this morning. Please put all those things out of your mind. And just open your heart and say, Lord, won't you please speak to me this morning in a special way through this old and familiar Story. Sometimes things become so familiar that we, we actually stop to prevent the Lord from speaking to us because we think we know everything that there is about it. Well, I want to tell you that when I was reading the story just, I, I don't know, not so long ago, uh, a few weeks ago, I was really struck by something uh, about this, this whole fact that God's grace in the lives of others can, call offense, can cause offense to us. You see, today is the first day of 2017, isn't it? Or at least I've been told that. And, uh, and I, just, I just believe that it is. And um, it's, it's the beginning of something new. And that's always exciting, isn't it? Uh, it's always nice to, to start at the beginning of the new year and say, 2016 is over. We can close the book on it. We can forget about all the lows. We can forget about all the defeats. We can forget about all the things that went wrong. And we can focus on an opportunity to do things right, to do things better. And that's normally what happens in the lives of most people at this time of the year. But, but, but I, I wonder what 2016 was for you. For me, it was a wonderful time. Um, Peter was just sharing last night at, the, at our service, in the, our chapel service, that, that last year was an incredible year for, for him, just being part of this this team. And for me as well, it's been a wonderful year. I've enjoyed every moment of it. I've really been incredibly blessed just being here. And of course, uh, you wonderful people whose faces I can't really see now, they're all a blur, but, but I, I know more or less where you are. You wonderful people have helped to make it a special blessing. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart <clears throat> for that. I thank the Lord for having brought us here. Uh, I thank the Lord for having brought Peter as well, I might say. <clears throat> Uh, because I'm a particularly righteous, sanctified person as, um, as, a, as a Wesleyan. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I really do mean that. Uh, you, you might not believe it from what happens in the service, but we're actually very good, fr <laughs> very good friends. <laughs> and um, we actually enjoy one another's company a lot. Of course, his theology is a different story, but <laughs> being a Baptist and all that jazz. But anyway, <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here. And, and I just thank the Lord for that. But you know, there are a lot of people in our church that haven't had a great 2016, and I know that. And we're aware of it as pastors. We know that some people have had debil debilitating illnesses, and, um, and some people have experienced painful injury, and, and some have been diagnosed with incurable diseases last year. And I know that that's, doesn't make the year very nice and very exciting and very happy for them, does it? Some people have developed marital problems. Some people have been through painful divorces that have really devastated them in so, on so many levels. And, and some of them have had incredible problems with their children. And I, I know what it's like as a parent to, to see your children making a mess of their lives. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like the father in the story. When his son went off to this, to this far country, there was nothing he could do about it, absolutely nothing. He had to let the man go because he was an adult. And you, you see, and, and I know that some of you are like that. Some of you have found yourselves trapped in, in, in addictions and in cycles of sinful behavior and habits that you just didn't manage to, <clears throat> to break out of. Ah, thanks, Ange. Oh, man, you're a real lifesaver. Thank you. And she puts it where I can see it as well. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe some of you have experienced, and I know that there are many who have, um, the, the passing of a loved one. And uh, some, 
might have been unexpectedly and might have been a young person and might have been an older person very close to you and, you, and you're still battling with the grief. 2016 was not a good year for you. And there are many people that are going to come to the end of this year and they're going to say, thank you, Lord, 2016 is over. But you know the sad part is that there are many people here and many people in our congregation and many people living around us in our community who are going to look forward to 2017 and have no hope. It just doesn't look as though things are going to get better. There is no reason for them to be happy. There is no reason for them to be, that they can see, for them to be excited about entering this, this, this new year. And, and that, is, that is very, very sad, isn't it? Um, I, I, want to, I want us just to think a little bit about this, this younger son. This younger son came and asked his dad for, the, for his share of the estate. And incidentally, um, I, um, uh, this wasn't rude. It wasn't uncommon. In fact, at that time, there was a Roman law which said that if uh, an adult, grown-up, mature, more than 20 years of age, um, uh, beneficiary of an estate came to the owner of the estate and said, I want my share. He was legally obliged to give that share to such a beneficiary. That was the law. The Syrophoenicians had a similar kind of law and somebody else living in that part of the world also had a similar, a similar kind of a law. I wasn't able to establish whether the Jews had actually adopted this um, into their custom, but whether they did or whether they didn't really doesn't matter. They were all aware of it. It was happening all around them. I mean, it was, it was the law of the Roman government and they actually fell under Roman law. So they were aware of it. And, and so when Jesus told the story, it, it wasn't anything strange. People could understand it. Um, you know, it wasn't like I, I heard somebody once say the younger son was wishing that his father was dead. I, I don't believe that. He just came to his father and he said, that which is mine, that which is rightfully my inheritance, I would like it and I would like it now, please. And, and so what would happen is they would um, they'd, uh, add up everything, all the lands, all their, all their livestock and all the slaves and, and all the improvements and everything else that they had and they'd draw up this balance sheet and they'd get a bottom line. And then he would divide it in three, the father would, in this story. And the older brother would get two thirds of that and the younger brother would get one third. And the younger brother, we are told, got his inheritance and, uh, and he went running off into a far country. And while he was there, he wasted what he had. He, he just absolutely obliterated it. And, um, and eventually, he landed up and he had nothing. But you see, it wasn't only his physical inheritance that he squandered. You know what else it was? It was his ideals. As a young man growing up in, the, in this Jewish home with his, with his Jewish father who, who taught him God's word and taught him the laws of God and taught him how to live and taught him what, what was valuable and, and, and what was right in the sight of God, taught him how to live in a righteous kind of a way. And, and I'm sure as that young boy, he would have had ideals. He would have said, I want to live like this. I want to be a good man. I want to be a righteous man. I want to do what's right. I want to be kind. I want to be merciful. I want to have loving kindness. I want to treat everybody around me with patience and with concern. That's what I want to do. This is my ideal. And then he went into the far country and found that there was a very, very different kind of ideal that, um, that governed life in that far country. And, and as a result, he started living according to them. You, you know, one of the worst things that we can ever do is to lose our inheritance that we get from our parents. If we've grown up in godly homes, and I thank the Lord that I did. I thank God for the godly parents and upbringing that I had and, and that my wife had as well. And it's just a wonderful thing. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to lose. I'll never forget when I was balloted. We still had the ballot in those days. And I was balloted and had to do my army uh, training. I was destined to go to the Wesleyan Seminary in in um, in, uh, in in the um, uh, where is it? in the West Rand East, East Rand in East Rand, and um, I uh, I went to my father when I got my ballots and I said, yeah, I've got to go to the army. So he said, we can get an extension. What do you want to do? 
Uh, so I said, no, no, let me get it over with, you know, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do my, my, my training after that. So I, I go to the Air Force. And, and when I get there, I see that they got these barbed wire fences all the way around this camp. And they got these huge big gates with a boom. And they got armed guards standing there with rifles. FNs we still used in those days. Yeah, he's got a rifle standing up. The thing is loaded. And, and you, you know what it's there for? Um, some of the guys walked in there and they said, oh, this is all to keep us in. Let's find a way out. I looked at the slot and I said, oh, this is wonderful. This is to keep all the outsiders out so that they can't get in and see what I'm going to do. You know, I'd, I'd grown up with this, with this strict, in the very strict upbringing. I'd never been to a movie in my life. Don't you feel sorry for me? Well, if you do, don't. I found out very, very quickly I hadn't missed a thing. And so we used to have these, these movies in, in, in the camp and uh, we could go along. They used to take the money off our pay. We used to get 50 cents a day and they still had the cheek to take two tuppence off for a movie. And I went to a couple of them and I thought, yeah, really, is this entertainment, I, you know, I could think of a lot better things to do. And I realized I hadn't missed anything, but, but you, you see, I, I wanted to experiment with these things. I wanted to find out what it's like to, to be just a little bit, little bit sinful, just to compromise a little bit on the ideals that I'd grown up with, ideals that came from the Word of God. And I just thank the Lord that He protected me. It must have been the prayers of my mom and dad that, that just kept me safe that I didn't get addicted to all these kind of things, that I, I was able to maintain and hang on to, to, to a testimony. And, um, uh, you know, I, I praise the Lord for that. But some of us lose our ideals. Some of us go into business, and we start doing things that we know are not right. We know we didn't grow up that way. We know it's not what is in God's Word, but it's convenient. It helps us to get ahead and after all, times are tough, aren't they? We live in, a, in, in, in the midst of what the story says, if there was a famine in the land. And sometimes we feel like that, don't we? It's, it, it's really tough economically, and it's, it's tough and it's difficult. And the temptation is to lose our ideals, which is part of our inheritance, which we should never, ever lose. The money you can make again, that's not the biggest deal. But your value system that's based on what God wants for us, never lose that because that brings incredible pain to us. And sometimes when the going gets tough, then, then that's what, what goes out the window. But you see, this young man, this younger son became impoverished in this far country, which I believe is a type of the world he became impoverished, and, and eventually he lands up as a, as a good Jewish boy feeding pigs. Now, I don't think we can fully understand what that actually meant, the, the insult that that was. You know, the, the Bible said that if you touched the skin of a dead pig, you were unclean for seven days. God didn't want you in his presence. He, you weren't allowed into the tabernacle or the temple or anything else. You had to go through a whole process of, of being cleansed. That, that was just touching the skin, never mind eating the thing or something else like that. And this man was living with pigs. And he got to the stage where he, where he was so in need that he wanted to eat the pods that the pigs were eating, eat pig's food. Man, it was the food that the pigs ate that made them unclean in the first instance, um, we probably, he probably thought. And here he, he, he wants to eat their food. Those pods weren't tasty. They, they weren't particularly nutritious. They, um, some wise guys have determined exactly what those pods were and what tree they came from. And, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing doesn't interest me. All I know is that pods are not tasty. They were sort of fibrous and they were hard and, and they were good for pigs. Pigs, but they're not good for human beings. And we have, um, we, we have a, um, a wonderful thing um, over here in, well, wonderful thing. We have an interesting thing in verse 16 where it says, He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And that word gave with the, in, in, in the Greek really has, carries the sense of nobody shared with him. 
Nobody shared with them. The, the owners of these pigs, of the, his employer, uh, they would eat reasonably every single day. And maybe even the other employees uh, that worked with them would, would eat reasonably, but nobody shared anything with them. Nothing. All, all he had to do was <laughs> feed himself with his pods. And then the Bible says this. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands don't have food enough to eat? He came to his senses. The, that's also a very interesting structure in, in the Greek. The theological word book of the, of the New Testament translates this phrase in this way. He came to a sensible frame of mind. He, uh, and it says in brackets, I, he started thinking clearly. And you know, this is the problem that we have in life. We don't think clearly. This is one of the main reasons why we need the Word of God. Because the Word of God teaches us how God thinks. These are God's thoughts that are written down here. When God gives us his laws, th th this is God's thoughts about things, and we need to take cognizance of it. We, we don't need to sit around and say, this doesn't apply to us today. This applied to us 2,000 people living 2,000 years ago, but this is not for us. It is for us. And I promise you that the things that go wrong in our life, when, when I look back on, on, uh, on my life, and incidentally, I've just entered, I'm told, injury time by my loving brother. Um, he says, you know, three score and 10, I've reached that. Now I'm uh, just turned 71, so I'm now in the first year into injury time. So the whistle can blow any time for me. And, uh, and I'm aware of that. I, I'm aware of the fact that there's less time in front of me than there is behind me. A lot more time is behind me. I don't know how much longer I've got to live. Um, and that, the, that's not the, not the most important thing to me. But what is important is that when I look back on my life, every time I've got myself into trouble, it's because I've deviated from what God tells us in his word. And, and I've allowed clever arguments and convoluted thinking to distract me from my Commitment to obey the Lord. And there is talk about grace and, you know, we're not under law anymore. Let me tell you something. If you want to live a blessed and a happy life, then obey God. Because that's the only reason why God has given us his law. Because he knows better than us. My dad used to tell me that. He used to say, I want you to do this because I know better than you. And I didn't always believe him. And I remember one day um, we, we, we got some bicycles, myself and my brothers, a lady bought us each a brand new bicycle, first brand new bicycle I'd ever had in my life. And it wasn't very long and I discovered that I could ride this bicycle with no hands on the handlebars. And I could even steer it. I could turn this bicycle one way or the other. And so I called my father and I said, hey, dad, come and have a look at this. Uh, you know, have a look at how great this son of yours is. And I get on the bicycle and I'm showing him how I could turn around in the parking lot uh, of the church next door to us and, and, um, and, and all these things. And he looked at that and he said, yeah, that's very impressive. He said, but I, I want to tell you something. I don't want you riding without your hands on the handlebars in the main road which ran in front of our house. That road is too busy, and you're gonna get a fright, and you're gonna get yourself seriously injured. I don't want you to do that over there. And, and then he said to me, and the, we had a dirt road running down um, next to the house on the other side of it, and he says, and I don't want you riding with no hands on that dirt road because there are potholes and there are loose stones and, and um, you're going to hit a loose stone or a pothole and you're going to fall off and you're going to get hurt and I don't want you to get hurt, so don't do it. And I looked at this crazy old man who's taking all the fun out of life. Can you believe it? Hey? That a man could be so strange. He says, you go down to the park and you can do it over there or you can do it in the parking lot over here, but, but you don't do it on, on the main road and you don't do it on this dirt road. 
Well, I knew better. I mean, I was 11 years of age, and I knew a lot better than my father with all his experience. Um, and uh, one day I'm, I'm riding down Greenock Avenue down towards the little sprite at the bottom over there and I'm going quite fast and I got my hands in my pockets and, and I'm pedaling away there and I'm going down the road and I hit a stone. <laughs> and this wheel swerves and, and, um, and I pull my hands out the pocket and I try and grab the handlebars. The only problem is the handlebars weren't where they were a few seconds ago and so I came down and I smashed my face right into where the handlebars connect with the little fork there and there was blood, I could taste it and, and I'm sort of spitting bits of tooth out and, and then I came off and as I said, I was going quite fast and I hit Greenock Avenue. I mean, it was like a Boeing landing um, at, uh, at one of these international airports. You go, tweet, tweet, and you see the smoke coming out. Well, that's the way I was and it was my hands, tweet, Treat. And so, you know, I, I had grazes and I had little pebbles under the skin when I came up. I was bleeding and I was in pain. Now, let me tell you something. Listen to me carefully. That wasn't my father punishing me, was it? That was the natural consequence of my stupidity and my disobedience. When my dad said to me, I don't want you to do this for your sake. And I didn't listen to him. I discovered why my dad lovingly didn't want me to do that. And it's exactly the same with God. Sometimes we get grunched up in life. We come a cropper and we've got blood all over the place and, and we are hurting and, and we're burning and, it's, and it's, it's just terrible, it's horrible, it's miserable. And we're there because we didn't listen to our heavenly Father. And here's this man, young man standing amongst these smelly pigs, hungry, feeling as though he's starving, feeling incredibly guilty, feeling that he's failed everybody, everything he tried to do, all the ideals that he had, the dreams and, and, and the aspirations of his young life had come to nothing, absolutely nothing. And then he comes to his senses, starts thinking sensibly, and he says, I need to get back to my father. And that's the most sensible thing that he could ever say. And so he gets up and he goes and he says, I'm going to say to my dad when I get there, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a slave or a servant in your household. And so I think, that's good. But then he gets up off his butt and he goes back to the Father. He actually gets this, not just something he thought. He actually does it. And he gets to his father, and his father is sitting there on the front veranda, and, and, um, and he's looking down the road that leads up to his house, and, and there in the distance, it says, while the sun was still a great way off, he sees him, and he jumps up. And he runs to his son. He's so happy to see him. He throws his arms around him and, 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 he, and, he, and he, he gives him a hug. The smelly, stinky guy. Still had the smell of pigs all over him. He, and he kisses him. Dirty and filthy though he was. He kisses him. And the, and the son says to him, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, and the father stops him right there. You see, it's true, he wasn't worthy. It's true, none of us are worthy. None of us will ever be worthy. But that's not the issue. That's not the basis of our um, being uh, reunited with our father. The, the basis of us being reunited with our father is God's grace. And so, Father calls, he, he cuts him short, doesn't listen to the rest of it. He says, calls his servants, he says, come here, come, bring a, bring a clean garment, bring some shoes for his feet, bring a ring, let's put it on his finger because this, my son, this, my son was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's fine. This, my son. Uh, he didn't want him to be a servant in his house. 
He didn't want, you know, very often when we've done something bad and we feel we've let the Lord down and we want to come back and we want to do something and show God how sincere we are and, 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 and maybe try and make up for, for all our bad behavior, it never works. God doesn't want you to be a servant in his house. He doesn't want slaves. He wants sons. That's what he wants. He wants people that he can relate to, have a meaningful, warm relationship with. That's what God wants of you, of all of us. And then he says, kill the fatted calf, we're gonna have a party. And boy, I wanna tell you, Gentiles don't know how to party. Jews know how to party. They always have. And yeah, they have a party. And, and man, it's a noisy affair and there's music. And, 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 and listen, there is dancing. Woo. And Jesus told that story. And Jesus was in favor of it. And, and, and yeah, they're having a great time. They are celebrating. They're celebrating life. They're celebrating a son that's come back. And, um, and just then, the, the older brother comes back from his work in the fields and, um, and he hears this noise. And he says to one of the other servants around, he says, what's going on here? And they say, your brother's arrived. Back home, can you believe it? He's come back without, uh, and he hasn't been harmed in any way. And your father is just over the moon. He is so happy. He has given this guy this, you know, amazing grace. And the older brother was offended by it. He became angry. He said, where's the tough love? Why didn't my father show tough love? Now, I believe in tough love. I really do. I think most of the, Pastors over here believe that there's a time for tough love. This father didn't apply it, and that offended this older brother. He said, what about the natural consequences? I mean, this man needs to learn that, that he can't go out and live the way that he lived, and there are no consequences. The father wasn't interested in that because he just extended grace to this man. Abundant grace, unbelievable grace, over-the-top kind of grace. Tim Keller wrote a book uh, many years ago called um, the prodigal God, you know the word prodigal doesn't mean somebody that's gone astray. It means somebody who spends extravagantly. And this young, this younger son was called prodigal because he, ex he spent extravagantly. He wasted all his inheritance. He, he just did stupid things and made foolish decisions and landed up totally impoverished. They were, uh, 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 the older brother was concerned that there was no justice in the whole thing. Surely, if the father loves him, there needs to be a sense of justice. This man must realize that he's got to work and he's got to pay back. And, and once he's paid back, then he can be accepted. Or uh, there was no restitution. The father didn't demand and say, all right, fine, I accept you as my son. Welcome back home. There's a field. Go and work it. And we'll deduct it off the money that you owe us. There was nothing like that. There was just grace with no conditions, no prerequisites, just grace. And the older brother was offended by it. And I wonder this morning if you've been offended by the grace that God has shown to others. I know some people who have. And I wanna to say to you this morning, you need to let it go. It's not worth it. Don't get offended by the grace of God. You know, John the Baptist sat in prison after being a good man. Peter Zero told us a few weeks ago that um, I'm what John Wesley, he's, he's got John the Baptist. Well, here's old John the Baptist. Did a great work being a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Faithful man. And he lands up in prison because he spoke against Herod having his brother's wife. I mean, that's just not on. And, and John said, this is the word of God? That's wrong. I'm telling you, it's wrong. Um, and so he gets arrested and thrown into prison for telling the truth, for taking a stand on what is right. And you know what? Jesus never came to visit him, not once. Can you believe it? The same Jesus that, that gave the parable in, in Matthew chapter 25 and said, as much as you haven't done this unto the least, you haven't done it to me. And he spoke about, uh, about those in prison you didn't, when I was in prison, you didn't visit me. Well, he didn't visit John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, I think, was kind of expecting it. 
expecting Jesus to say something about his imprisonment, perhaps to do something about it. And so eventually in despair, he gets some of his disciples and he says, go to this man and ask him if he is the Messiah or are we waiting for somebody else? We need to know. Put us out of our misery. Tell us the truth. And, uh, and the, these men come to John the Baptist and they, they ask the question and Jesus says, you go back to John and you tell him this. Tell him that the eyes of the blind are opened. Those who are lame are walking. Tell him what you've seen. Tell him about the miracles. But also tell him this. Blessed are those who are not offended because of me. You, you see, God just has a different way of doing things. Jesus had a different way of doing things. And a lot of people were offended. Can you believe it? By Jesus when he lived here on this earth. They were offended by him. A lot of people stopped following him. Talk about a big back door. Wow, one day he's, he's feeding 5,000 men, women and children beside. And, and the next day he's saying to the 12, his 12 um, disciples that were left there with him, he says, are you guys also going to leave me? They all left. You know why? Because he offended them. And I, I know that there are a lot of people that get offended by God and God's dealings in our lives and other people's lives. Let it go. My brother and sister, let it go. Don't be like this angry older brother who's left outside. You know what the irony of the whole thing is? God wants sons. Both of these men wanted to be slaves. This, this older brother actually said to, to his father, he said, all these years I have slaved for you. The father didn't want him to be a slave. He didn't want him to, to, to have the sense that he's working like a slave. Uh, obviously, he wanted his son to serve him because he was part of the estate and, and he wanted the son to work for him, but he wanted him to work as a son, not as a slave. And there are many people in the church that work faithfully, hard, dedicatedly, but they're working as slaves. They're not working as sons. God is saying this morning, I want sons. The younger brother wanted to be a son. Make me a, make me a slave, he said. Um, and the father said, no, 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 no. You're a son. You're not a slave. To the older brother, he went and he begged and he pleaded with him and he says, don't be like this. Don't be offended by my grace and my kindness. Please come in and join the celebration. I want you as a son. But the, he was, this older brother was fixated on the fact I've slaved for you. I've obeyed your every command. And you didn't even give me a goat. <laughs> and here's this guy that's wasted everything. He's got all of the rest of it. There are three things I want to challenge you on this morning. I want you to think of this as we, as we come to a close. This is it. Get over your offenses. Don't drag them into 2017. Get rid of them. Let them go. Do I understand all God's dealings in my life? No, I don't. But I can promise you one thing. When I look back after 44 years in the ministry and I see all the things that have happened to me and my wife and my family, I can see God's hand in it. At the time, I didn't always see God's hand. In fact, I saw the devil and I saw all kinds of other things. And I'm sure the devil had a part in it, um, some of the bad things that happened. But you know what? When I look back, I can see God's hand in it. Don't be offended. Let it go. The second thing is, come to your senses. Really, and, and, and what I mean by that is, is just say, Lord... I want to think sensibly. I want to think correctly. I want to think according to your word. You, you know what God's, uh, we, we have as men, we have great um, uh, appeals. We have altar calls, we like to call them. God had one, and this is it. He says, let the wicked man forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Because my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. For even as the heavens are higher than the earth, says the Lord, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
That's what God wants. Are you willing to come to your senses this morning and say, Lord, I'm sick and tired of being in this pigsty. I'm sick and tired of being in this mess. I'm sick and tired of the pods that I've got to eat. When I feel as though I'm starving, I'm sick and tired of it. I want to get out of this mess. The first thing you've got to do is say, Lord, I'm willing to live according to your word. It's because I haven't that I've landed up in this pigsty, in this far land, far country. Please, Lord, I want to get back. And the second thing that I, I, I believe that the Lord wants us to do is to, um, is to actually get up and do something. Like that young man did. He got up off his butt and he did something. And the third thing is, let the offenses go. Don't drag them with you. Please, please, I beg you. On behalf of God who loves you more than you could imagine, who wants to shower you with grace that will offend other people. <laughs> Won't you let it go this morning? We're going to pray in a moment, and I would love to pray for every single one of you. But I just want to say, if the Lord has spoken to you this morning about something, I don't know, it doesn't matter what it is, and I, I want you to do something about it, okay? I want you right now just to stand up where you are. Get your butt off that of, of that seat and say, Lord, I want 2017 to be different. I don't want to go in thinking all the wrong things, and I, I don't want to go on living where I am right now. I want it to be different. I want it to be according to your word and according to your will. I'm going to pray in a moment, and if, you, if you've just felt God speaking to you, then why don't you just stand up? I know that this is not the Norwegian settlers thing. You're lucky. In the Wesleyan church, we have to have altar rails. Every Wesleyan church has an altar rail. And we ask people to come down there. And I'd love to pray with you. The only others that want to stand, I'm going to pray right now. Lord, I just bring these people to you. I, 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 don't, I, I can't even see who it is. I don't have my glasses on, but you know who they are. You see them, Lord. You know their hearts. That's the important thing. And you are the only one who can change the heart of man. Nobody else can. And here we stand before you, Lord, and I'm standing as well, because we want 2017 to be different to 2016. We don't want to live in the same way that we did. We want to live differently. Lord, we want to live according to your word. We want to experience your blessing, not, not just blessing in a superficial way. You know what I mean, Lord. We want to experience your will being worked out in our lives. And so I just pray for every single one right now in Jesus' name. Be with them. I, I believe, Lord, that you can work in their lives. I believe that they sincere having stood. They indicating, this is what I want, Lord. I want 2017 to be different. Make it different for them, I pray. And just help them to follow you more carefully. Let's come into relationship with our Heavenly Father, folks. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen.